Working Cows Podcast, episode 294. This episode is brought to you by C90 Ocean Minerals. Welcome to the podcast that gives producers a platform to discuss and share paradigm-challenging practices. Practices that have increased the effectiveness of their operation and the joy that their families have received from this lifestyle. Howdy, everybody. It's Clay Connery, host of the Working Cows podcast, here with another episode brought to you by C90 Ocean Minerals. Do you want to grow healthier, more nutrient-dense food this season? Introducing C90 Grower Series, a new line of mineral and trace element products for your home, garden, and homestead. Give C90 Grower Series a try and be amazed at the improved quality and taste of your fruits and vegetables. Tomatoes that taste like you remember growing up are possible again by ensuring they have access to all of nature's macro and trace minerals. C90 Grower Series is also a powerful microbiology booster for compost and compost teas, dramatically increasing their strength and potency. C90 Grower Series is now available, and listeners of the Working Cows podcast can receive 20% off the new lineup with code GROWCOWS. Or visit us at c-90.com slash grow cows. Very excited to be joined today by Dr. Ken Olson and Jalen Whaley. Uh, I think I've teased this episode a couple of times, but some scheduling things came up and had to had to move it around a bit. But n- very excited to talk to them today about the need for sheep on western ranges specifically, but really Everywhere, small ruminants are necessary because undergrazed land in the east tends toward brush encroachment, and overgrazed land in the west tends toward uh, brush encroachment. So really, they become a tool f- everywhere uh, that is that is in our toolbox as far as dealing with brush. And so uh, really excited to talk to them. Of course, Ken uh, has a wealth of knowledge in this uh, area. He's done uh, his PhD work specifically on small ruminants and their role uh, in Western contexts in places like Utah and, and New Mexico and, and some of those things. So uh, very excited to welcome him. And for the first time, uh, Jalen Whaley. Jalen uh, is an extension sheep specialist. I think she kind of stepped into the role vacated by Dave Olila, who's been a guest here a couple of times on the Working Cows podcast. So uh, very excited to talk to them about the need for small ruminants in Western contexts, but really everywhere, as I said. So uh, Dr. Olson and Jalen, thanks for joining me today on the Working Cows podcast. Good afternoon. It's good to join you as well. Yeah, thanks for having us. So uh, I've been saying... Uh, on the Working Cows podcast and in, in other uh, venues that I recently went on a hiking trip where I carried an elk license and a uh, rifle with me and, uh, you know, can't eat tag soup, but it was good time to see some different country and definitely got introduced to some different country. And Jalen, as I understand it, was in in your neighborhood anyways, the neighborhood that you grew up in. And I was struck there by the amount of brush that there was at least the ranch that we drove through to get to the public land we were hunting and other places too. The amount of brush that there was in, in that part of the world, uh, is it, was that unique? Was that something that I was seeing that was unique just to that area? Or is it a lot of, uh, the mountain West that looks like that with that amount of brush in it? Um, I think we tend to see a little bit more brush kind of across the mountains and kind of the intermountain West area. <clears throat> certainly more than we see here in Western South Dakota. Um, and some of that could have been also a response to the fact that they've been in a pretty significant drought uh, the last couple of years. Um, those brush spe- species probably just did a little bit better um, than, than some of the grass or other forb species. Sure. Yeah, the, the sagebrush is really deep rooted, so it's going to be able to do better uh, longer into a drought before it really gets moisture deficient. And then, of course, if it's if it's a cattle grazing situation, cattle um, 
they'll eat some, but they don't eat a lot of the sagebrush. So, so of course, you'll the grass will disappear as the cattle graze it, and the sagebrush just gets that much more prominent. Yeah, and I didn't see this place, you know, other than just the the ten days I was there. Uh, but those ten days I was there, there was there was uh, cattle and a lot of mule deer. <laughs> That's what I saw in that place. But no no goats or sheep domestic goats or sheep or small ruminants that I, that I saw. And I don't know if, you know, I, I would say, I don't think I was looking at sagebrush necessarily in that, in that instance. Is there other uh, common types of brush in that, in, in that part of the world? Yeah. Um, we get pretty thick with some stuff. Um, I know as a kid, we did a lot of, um, picking choke cherries and sarvis berries and you see a lot of those, um, we have pretty, especially along your river bottoms, pretty extensive willow type, <clears throat> um, patches as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And these, these would have been more of the choke cherry size that I was seeing. And I don't know if sagebrush in that country, uh, is it similar in size to this, to this part of the world? Bigger. It's much bigger. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, maybe not so much as like your, your sagebrush step type environments that you get kind of as you go into Western, southwestern Wyoming and those kind of areas. Um, but definitely big sagebrush is the species. Um, so it gets quite a bit bigger than the sagebrush here. Yeah. Yeah. But you, for a, when you just look across the landscape, you, you think it's all got gray leaves and it's all obviously a woody bush sort of a plant. We all just think sagebrush, but there's, I don't know, five, six, seven species, different mm-hmm. species of sagebrush um, that, that like, like Jay Lynn says, big sagebrush can get, I don't mean, I mean, I've seen it as tall as somebody on its eyeball level to somebody riding horseback and, in, in in better soil spots. Um, but like she said, you get into the more dry country, like Southern Wyoming and, um, uh, uh, it's actually called the Wyoming subspecies of big sagebrush, and it only gets maybe foot to two feet tall. Mm-hmm. Sure. And then you get further out in the desert in like the, um, like out in Nevada, and it's like six inches tall, and it's a it's completely different species again. Sure. Yeah, so that's kind of, you know, I guess what what spurred me on for this conversation was – as we drove through there the first day, I think, I, yeah, we drove, th- we drove in, in the daylight on the first day. And, and I, I said, this place needs about 10,000 goats. <laughs> so <laughs> would that make a difference in that part of the world? Would, would there be some benefit to running a, a small ruminant or a goat specifically in that part of the world in your, in your guess or your estimation? Yeah. And <clears throat> actually that part of the world at one point had a pretty large, um, commercial sheep presence. There's a lot of, um, Greek culture in that kind of Northwestern Craig area. And so there used to be huge bands of sheep that ran all through the mountains there. Um, and there's several factors that have decreased the sheep population, but it would definitely, definitely help for sure. Um, I'm not as familiar with goats preference to things like sagebrush. Um, they'll definitely graze your choke cherries and those kind of things more readily. Um, here in South Dakota, we're doing a lot of research with um, Western red cedar and goats impact on that. And they do a, a pretty good job of managing red cedar populations. Um, but sheep for sure, there's been historically some research kind of in that Northern Colorado, Southern Wyoming type area um, that shows that during winter time, sheep can actually graze that extremely well and it's it maintains its nutritive value which is really nice so we still have a high protein feed source even throughout the winter um when the sheep will eat it how long would something like that take because i i think the way that we see most people managing this brush encroachment whether it's uh red cedar here or other places we see a lot of them managing it with fire uh, especially mm-hmm. along the Missouri River in South Dakota, where you don't have to worry so much about it getting out of hand. So, is it how how long would something to, like that take to manage a brush species uh, in a meaningful way? 
using goats or, or sheep? It's gradual. And, and it's it just a slow, it starts immediately. If you get and uh, change up the species, you know, bring in sheep. So you got to mix the cattle and sheep and that'll change the, the, the competitive balance among the plants. If the sheep start eating species like the sagebrush or cedar or whatever that the cattle were ignoring and you'll see a gradual change. Um, you know, sagebrush comes into the westernmost counties in South Dakota. So Harding, Butte, uh, Fall River counties, there's there's quite a bit of sagebrush. And enough that sheep grazing is still, it, we're, we're quite fortunate that we have a fairly strong range based commercial sheep industry in western South Dakota to take advantage of that. And if we didn't have sheep grazing on a lot of the, those western range lands in those western counties, we'd, we'd probably see a lot more sagebrush than we do. Um, a few years ago, at the uh, uh, we used to have a research station up in SDSU did up in Harding County, which was called the Antelope Research Station. And uh, we had both sheep and cattle on that station. And one of the interesting things that I never understood about the history of the station was that there were sheep pastures and there were cow pastures and they were never grazed together. And you could see the difference be between those two parts of the station in that uh, the sheep pastures had absolutely no sagebrush in them. They had grazed it out. And this is decades of sheep grazing. Um, the cow pastures had a lot of sagebrush, and we, it, we 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 could have benefited from moving the critters around. Unfortunately, um, you need different fencing to hold sheep in, and you need more water for cattle. And so we we put the sheep in the driest part of the place that had poor water because they just have a lower water requirement and did not really have the resources to move them around to take advantage of that difference in vegetation. Jalen, earlier you mentioned that there used to be uh, quite a few uh, bands of sheep there around Craig, which is I was north northeast of Craig a little bit where I was hunting. And um, what was, was like in my neighborhood, I know a lot of people will say coyote pressure, predator pressure was one of the things that pushed them out of the sheep business. Do you know what some of those things out were that were, uh, a contributing factor to the sheep leaving that part of the world? Yeah, our predator pressure was definitely an issue. Um, we've got pretty heavy bear and mountain lion influence up in that area, plus the coyotes and now wolves, but that's a whole different topic for another day. Um, but so predators were certainly a part of that. Um, <clears throat> a lot of what contributed to declining sheep numbers kind of across the country was. Um, when they got rid of the government, got rid of the wool incentive yeah. program. Mm -hmm. uh, and so when our, our wool prices started, or we had no incentive to raise high quality wool. Um, we saw producers drop there. Um, plus <clears throat> just the fact that um, some of our, you, we talked earlier about having to hire um, outside labor and that kind of thing. Our labor expenses have gotten so high um, that running cattle just became easier because we don't have to worry about the predator problems. And typically you don't have the same type of, um, labor that you do in the sheep industry. Is zero sagebrush a good ecological goal? <laughs> <laughs> no, not really. It, in those environments where sagebrush is is native to the environment, which would be across most of the Western U.S. It 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 belongs there. It serves a role there. Um, in in terms of it, it, it's simply a part of the landscape that that needs to be there. If it wasn't there, uh, we'd probably have we'd either have nothing, as in we'd have bare ground, which would not be good, 
or we would have something much less desirable than sagebrush, like noxious weeds. Mm. And then we we, it, we we really be worrying about now what do we graze this with in terms of sheep or goats or so forth. Um, uh, if in in that case, uh, <clears throat> you know, and, and and I guess the flip side of that question is then there's a balance between too much sagebrush and not enough, right? So, yes, I would say what I was seeing was too much brush, whether that was. A, a species of sagebrush or choke chair or whatever I was seeing, I would say that was too much. But then on the other end of that, you're talking about the antelope research station where they only ever had the sheep in certain pastures and they grazed the sagebrush out. So there's a balance there. Would you agree yeah. with that? Yes. And the other, the other place that it's really important is, is, is it's important forage for a lot of wildlife species. You know, you mentioned when you were hunting, you, you saw a lot of mule deer. It's it's a it's a staple in the diet of mule deer and antelope. That's why we have sizable antelope populations um, in the westernmost counties in South Dakota and even more in Wyoming because sagebrush and some of those other shrubs we've already talked about are are so prevalent there that that. And that's that's a core part of an antelope diet. They eat very little grass. Hmm. And so, okay, so I guess this is the Working Cows podcast. <laughs> and <laughs> so, um, and and somebody one time, and I don't know if I've ever said this on the podcast, but I'll say it here. Somebody one time caught me at the sheep sale barn in in Newell and said, "Aren't you the Working Cows podcast guy?" And I said, "Yeah, uh, this is how I work." cows my sheep and somebody else's cows <laughs> i do custom <laughs> grazing of other people's cows and i run my own little flock of sheep and so um i guess i would like to hear your perspective from both of you on the mechanics of the you know traditional cattle operation re i would say in a lot of cases reincorporating sheep because i think most of the west had sheep on it at one time um, reincorporating sheep into their operation. What are some of the things that they should consider? How should they go about it? Um, and what are some of the things they should expect from a, a benefits standpoint? So I think we'll start with the first of those three questions I just asked, which, uh, how, do, how do they go about, or what, how, how do they go about incor reincorporating sheep into their operation? Um, yeah, I think that's a question that I get fairly often, um, <clears throat> is where to start. Um, and like you said, with some, somebody who's got a small flock and that contract grazing concept is growing in popularity in the sheep industry. Um, obviously we know what a struggle it can be to find pasture all the time. Um, but if somebody's willing to even let you essentially borrow their sheep to graze out some of those weeds, um, here in South Dakota, that's been really effective on things like leafy spurge. Uh, <clears throat> and now a lot of those cattle producers that were contract grazing with sheep um, are actually looking at getting their own flocks. And so that's an option to get you started um, if you don't want to take the deep dive into actually purchasing your own flock. Um, but definitely, like Ken alluded to, you have to take into consideration your fences. Um and actually, a lot of a lot of sheep will stay within a five wire fence, but um, not everybody worries about having a five wire fence with their cattle. Um, so it is it is certainly an option. But a lot of times, if we're really trying to target a specific species, it's easier to more intensely graze that certain location. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, so, like the producer that has done a really nice job with leafy spurge. Um, has Peruvian herders that come in and move electronet fencing every every day. Um, and that's pretty intensive, but um, can be an option if if you really need to get rid of some species of plant that you don't want. Yeah, and that was gonna gonna be my my follow-up question is how, how many of those contract grazing uh, arrangements, included a herder is that m more or less common would you say it's here in south dakota for sure it's less common um you tend to see more of those h2a type workers in places like wyoming um 
we don't see very many of them at all actually here in South Dakota. Um, mostly because those contracts have gotten um, a lot more fickle and whatnot, but um, you certainly don't have to have, it doesn't have to be that intense either to where you need a herder with them all the time. Sure. Yeah. I did a whole episode on using uh, H2A workers and Sage Askin was my guest for that episode. And he talked about the fact that basically he's hired a consulting agency that that's what they do (laughs) is handle all the paperwork and the relationships between them and the H2A worker. And then he said, that's basically my job is to travel from one H2A worker to the other and resupply them. Uh, yeah. so, cause they run, I think, I don't know how many, I think they were up to five, five bands of use that were running with H2A workers. And so he just travels from one camp to the next, make sure they have, have what they need and they're happy and sheep, sheep are good. And then be there on the big working days. So yeah. I think it's definitely an opportunity, um, in that probably could be, uh, expanded into, into Western South Dakota or this part of the, this part of the world. Um, but it's not without its headaches for sure. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. The other option um, that I've proposed to people is just buying, buying some lightweight lambs and then essentially just running them like you would yearlings, just a short term type deal where you're running them to, I don't know, 80, 90 pounds or even some kind of a grass fat type lamb. Um, Then it's just a short term deal. You can see if you like it um, much like yearlings, lambs tend to be a little bit more work too, but, um, it's at least a short-term option. What kind of intensity do you think is necessary to make a meaningful difference as far as weeds or brush are concerned is when you're talking about grazing, grazing sheep or, or goats? It, I think, I think the, the tar, what your goal is and, and your target, if it, if you're targeting a noxious weed species, like Jay Lynn mentioned, leafy spurge, and you you need to do damage to that plant without with, with little in, with little effect on anything else. Then it, you need a high intensity. If you want to do more of a, uh, I just want to add a sheep enterprise to the cattle enterprise that's already on the land, uh, and and we don't need to. We don't need to put up, go to electric fencing and herders and so forth. Then uh, you just let them run on the landscape, much like I think Jay Lynn was suggesting with uh, run some run some lambs, like we run yearling cattle. Um, it, the the intensity would be less. Perhaps you're you're not going to get any you're not going to get any specific damage to a targeted. Uh, unwanted species, but yet you're going to get a landscape level change in terms of the balance of different kinds of plant use. Uh, it's, I, I guess what I'm trying to say, it needs to be, you, you need to target the intensity of management to meet the goal that you have for why you want to bring the sheep onto the land. Yeah, no, I think that, that makes sense. The, the, you know, you got to start out with a goal in mind. What am I trying to accomplish here? Uh, and, and then, you know, match your grazing to, to yep. that. Um, yeah. So, I, you know, I think that, that there's a lot of, a lot of factors affecting, uh, people's willingness to run sheep. Um, and I, and I think that the, the labor seems to be one of those, um, higher, higher labor requirements for them. Are there ways that you've seen people successfully manage those, uh, those labor requirements or, or, uh, overcome that obstacle? Like I said, start like starting with your fencing, um, and just stringing an extra wire is an easy enough way to keep, keep your use in. Um, the nice thing about sheep that I like to talk about from a labor perspective is that when you look at their reproduction cycle, um, a cow is never or hardly ever in a maintenance diet. Mm-hmm. Um, and if they are, typically we're going to sell our open cows. <laughs> a ewe will spend, um, can spend up to about four months of the year, depending on when you wean your lambs in a maintenance diet. And so there's four months of the year that those sheep could be grazing one of your more low quality pastures. Um, where you maybe don't want your cattle at at the moment. So 
there are certainly options for for grazing them somewhere that is less labor intensive. Um, And I think the other thing is you don't necessarily, if you're going to go full board with sheep, you don't necessarily have to shed lamb. I know some people think that that's pretty labor intensive, um, but a lot of people, especially Wyoming, Western South Dakota, still do a lot of pasture lambing. Um, You push your dates back a little further into April, May, um, and you'll you'll still hit some pretty good lamb markets um, and with a lot less labor. Yep, that's what we did. We bought some May lambing ewes, and honestly, those girls are rangy enough that they <laughs> you can pick that lamb up and take it to a jug somewhere, but she's going to go lay down by her pile of afterbirth and wait for you to bring him back because <laughs> she's not. <laughs> you know they, that was they were five and six year old ewes when we bought them, and they hadn't been messed with much at lambing, and they weren't. They weren't going to be messed with much. They just are going to do their thing and uh, you help them if, if you can. But if not, you know, they're, you're not going to get the, the high percentage, uh, high lambing percentage that, that the shed lambed guys will. Uh, but you probably have fewer multiple births as well, um, I think, in, in a range lambed scenario anyways. So at least in my yeah. experience anyways. Yeah, it's definitely a balance between what you want to put you know, you put more into it, shed lambing, you feed them a little more, um, you have higher input costs, but your chances are you have higher lambing and weaning percentages, as opposed to if you don't want to put the labor into them, um, you're going to see that as well. Uh, The other thing I think that's neat about the labor perspective of sheep is like Ken said, they have a much lower water requirement. So especially like during these big storms that we had not that long ago, um, I know several producers that They'd go out and check their sheep, but at least they didn't have to worry about water because sheep can maintain enough water from snow and dew on grass and things like that. Um, That if you've got a pasture that doesn't have super great water access, um, sheep are are perfect for that. And that's why a lot of Western South Dakota was founded on uh, sheep pastures um, because our, our water resources just aren't as abundant as they could be. Yeah. Yep. My dad always used to say that there isn't a ranch north or west of Belfouche that wasn't paid for with sheep. And then when I moved out east of Belfouche, I recognized that it's it's basically everywhere. <laughs> that yep. Sheep paid for. Do you, go ahead. And you think about the history and the, they paid for the land the first time. <laughs> They've paid for it repeatedly. If you, you know, my history of coming, coming from northern Montana is as the, my dad took over the the place from his dad at the end of the, in the early forties. So it was the end of the dust bowl and nobody had been able to farm and all the livestock were gone and nobody had any money. So he, my dad didn't have any money to buy cows. So he, he bought sheep and he paid off the debt and got the finances straight when well, you were running sheep and then switched to cattle when he could afford to buy cattle. Yep, I was just talking. Uh, I think that happened a lot in that era. And again, in the 50s, when after we had a drought period then and probably should have happened in the 80s when we had the farm financial crisis period that we did. Unfortunately, the economics weren't there then because of things like the wool and Sandy program going away, as Jay Lynn mentioned, and the and. Uh, land prices were were terrible. At least we have decent. We we've had decent prices quite a bit of the time in recent years for both wool and lambs to help make it a more viable enterprise. Yeah, is that wool incentive program um, is that back in the form of the LDP or is there is it was it better even before that? <laughs> It was different. Okay. It was a completely different program. And no, it's not back. No, I think wool LDP right now is 40 cents. Yeah. This episode is brought to you by C90 Ocean Minerals. Do you want to grow healthier, more nutrient-dense food this season? Introducing C90 Grower Series, a new line of mineral and trace element products for your home, garden, and homestead. Give C90 Grower Series a try and be amazed at the improved quality and taste of your fruits and vegetables. 
Tomatoes that taste like you remember growing up are possible again by ensuring they have access to all of nature's macro and trace minerals. C90 Growers Series is also a powerful microbiology booster for compost and compost teas, dramatically increasing their strength and potency. C90 Grower Series is now available, and listeners of the Working Cows podcast can receive 20% off the new lineup with code GROWCOWS. Or visit us at c-90.com slash growcows. Where do, where do you think people should start? And we've talked a little bit about getting started with sheep, but do you, um, is it does it require... Uh, Increased fencing infrastructure, is it basically a requirement to, to do the increased fencing infrastructure? I mean, right now, in my, in my instance, we've got four, four barbed wires around the outside and three uh, hot wires along as a subdivision basically. And, and our sheep are running out in that. And we've never had them go out through the barbed wire fence. So I don't know if that's just a content sheep thing <laughs> or if that's, uh, I don't know what, what that, maybe it's low density. They're at pretty low density right now, given the time of year, but uh, I guess I, I'm wondering uh, kind of what the minimum infrastructure you would say, is it five wires or is it more than that? Or just depends on, on the style of management. What would you say? I think it definitely just depends on the style of management. Like you said, the low density thing definitely helps. Um, I mean, as long as there's feed there, chances are they'll be okay. <clears throat> um, there is a little bit of breed differences depending on who you ask. Um, they'll say a black face type sheep will crawl a fence no matter what. <laughs> so it might take some more infrastructure. Um, but the thing that I guess the big takeaway that I would say is if you're thinking of getting into it, buy sheep from a producer that raises them in a similar environment as you. Um, if you don't want to put a lot of work into fencing, then find a producer that has sheep, like you said, where they stay in those those three or four wires. Um, they'll learn to respect a fence for sure. So um, that's where it helps to do your research a little bit and re- find sheep that are raised in a similar environment. I guess the other thing I would say is um, we've talked quite a bit about water, um, but making sure that if you've got cattle tanks that your sheep have are able to access those tanks, a lot of us have... Um, you know, like a big tire tank or something of that sort. Um, lambs have a hard time reaching in those tanks. And even sometimes a mature you, depending on the height of the tank. Um, but the other thing that we see is an issue with some of those really big tanks like that is the sheep will actually fall in them and drown. <laughs> and so, you know, they're not accused of being the most intelligent animals all the time. Um But I've seen people put cinder blocks or something like that in the bottom of their tanks if they've got sheep in those pastures just to help alleviate some of that pressure. But making sure that um, your sheep can get to it. If you're in a stock dam, um, we know that cows can make all around the stock dam pretty muddy and mucky. Lambs especially tend to get stuck in those boggy type areas. So if you're looking at running one following the other and you're you know that your stock dams get boggy um i would probably recommend to put your sheep in that pasture first just to make sure that um the cattle aren't tromping down all around the water source yeah what are the advantages and disadvantages of the different styles of management as far as the ways that people are in in, uh, interfacing their cattle and their sheep like uh, my intention this year, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> my intention is to run our ewes with some yearlings that we're taking in uh, from mm-hmm. the outside. Um, but I know a lot of people do a leader follower type of scenario uh, where there's one and then the other. Uh, so what are what are some of the in, uh, advantages and disadvantages of the different ways that people will run them uh, interface cattle and sheep? I'd make two comments toward that one. Um, Many years ago, uh, I, I worked in Utah before I came to South Dakota and, and was involved in mixed species grazing uh, research where we were running cattle and, and it was cow-calf pairs and ewe lamb, lambs all together versus cows, cattle alone and sheep alone. Um, and 
And it worked great. I mean, there was all kinds of benefits to it in terms of changing the vegetation, you know, getting that more balanced grazing with both species because they're each eating different things and so forth. So that all, I mean, the benefits were really clear and the animals did better too because they weren't competing head to head for eating the same thing in, in the pasture. And particularly the sheep benefited from from being mixed with cattle where half, you know, instead of a pasture loaded to carrying capacity with just sheep, it was half sheep, half cattle. And, and the, and the sheep performance went up uh, quite dramatically and versus sheep alone, mm-hmm. if they were mixed with cattle, because they weren't competing so much for the same forage. Um, lamb, lamb percentages went up and lamb weaning weights went up both in, in that mixed situation. Um, and that all worked great out in that country, but a couple, a couple different things here in South Dakota relative to there is some of our mineral nutrition issues in that we're short on copper here in the Northern Plains. And therefore we have to feed for cattle, which have a fairly high copper requirement, we need to feed a cattle mineral supplement that's that's so high in copper that it's toxic for sheep because their copper requirement, and therefore also their level of the amount of copper they'll be toxic is quite different. So that's the primary reason you rarely see sheep and cattle in the same pasture uh, in this part of the world is because we need to we need to keep the, the sheep out of the cattle pasture, and then when we move the sheep in it after the cattle are gone, we got to remember to get the cattle mineral out of the pasture so we don't kill a bunch of ewes. And I had a second thought that I I can't think of, but anyway, there's there, there it, it, that that's led to the most people doing a leader follower. So the second thing is, I knew if I if I BS for a second, I dream up the other reason. The the other reason to consider leader follower is think about at the time of year, which species has the highest nutrient requirement. Um, and and this goes back to something Jan has said earlier. There's times a year that you've got dry, open ewes because they you've weaned their lambs. They aren't you haven't you haven't bred them yet because they aren't going to need to be bred till the fall again. And so they can they can deal with a pretty low nutrient requirement situation. And let's say you're running cows and they're lactating yet in the in the late summer and into the fall, or you're running yearlings and you want to you want these these years these yearling cattle to keep gaining later into the summer. Let them be the leaders and put the ewes as the followers to kind of, you know, clean things up after, you know, do a fairly light grazing with the cattle and then clean up the pasture with with the sheep. There might be other times of year, like you get further into the fall and you, and it's going to be breeding season and you need to flush those ewes a little bit. You may want to switch that rotation up, but the, the, the sheep as leaders so they can, they can do the, skimming the good stuff and make make some dry cows um, clean up the pasture. Well, and I think it'll depend on what your goals are as an operation also. Like if we're talking about targeting some of these um, weed species or <clears throat> um, brush species, uh, especially on like the forb side of things, if we're trying to manage things like leafy spurge or Dalmatian toad flax, some of those, um, we want to graze those earlier before the plant has the opportunity to flower. Plus they're more palatable when they're young uh, as a younger plant. Um, So that's an instance where you might put your sheep in ahead of your cattle um, and make sure to pull them out before they start grazing your grass species. Um, The other cool thing about um, using sheep and cattle together is you can actually use them to clean up parasite loads on pastures. Um, So with sheep, we have a huge issue, especially um, in the Western U.S. with barber pole worm. Well, everywhere in the U.S. It's a it's a nationwide issue. But um, cattle aren't as susceptible to the barber pole worm as a sheep is. And so if you've got a pasture that, you know, um, maybe it's have sheep in there in the past and you had a worm issue, um, you can run your cows through it and they'll kind of clean up some of that pasture um, before you run your sheep into it and vice versa. The worm species that we typically worry about in cattle aren't nearly as lethal to sheep. Sure. And what I would say about running cattle and sheep together from my own experience is that it's a good, it works really well 
until you're into a substitution feeding scenario. <laughs> if you're supplement Absolutely. feeding, I think you're pro you could probably get away with it, but substitution feeding, then when you've got everybody in one line, uh, you're probably going to get some injuries to the sheep, uh, the ewes, mm -hmm. and for sure the the younger ewe lambs are are probably prone more prone to getting stepped on in that scenario than than you might think before you do it, speaking from experience in December. <laughs> <laughs> so Yeah, they don't compete well for hay space or bunk space for sure. Right. Right. Yep. Um so as far as the leader follower is concerned, is there is there a need for time between grazing events or like do you need to have basically full recovery time before you bring those those use in behind those yearlings in in that scenario or if it's if they're close enough together as far as the amount of time between them can you run them really closely one behind the other it's actually recommended to run them pretty close together um that way you're not allowing for quite as much of the regrowth of the undesirable stuff plus um it's it's actually better for some of our native species to graze them more closely together. Um, it allows for some further regrowth later on. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Uh, the the being better for the native species, grazing them close together, kind of just how how does that work, or what what's what's going on there that makes that true? It, well, anybody that's followed the ranching for profit school line of thinking or the 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 holistic resource management principles that are really fairly similar uh, it's about time control of grazing and it's about the, the and the concept there is, is that you focus the grazing in as short a period of time as you can and create longer rest periods and you do that by having more pastures and animals are in each pasture for a shorter period of time. And then it's a long time before you, the, the resting goes on before you come back to that pasture. So if, if you run the sheep, so let's say the sheep are, are a leader, are your leader species and you run them through, and then you don't come right behind them with the cattle and you wait a few weeks. Well, rather than allowing a long rest period, you've, you've allowed a really short one, which is just enough time for those desirable native grass species to start regrowth. And then you go and you eat that off again, because both species are going to focus on that new, really lush regrowth. Um, and you're not going to get that that difference in grazing and what you're going to do is you're going to those plants are just starting to recover from that first grazing and the second one will damage them whereas if you keep both species back to back yeah it's a pretty intense grazing but then it's a, an extremely well it's the longest possible rest period sure and so we're talking going from a, a two to a four day graze period basically or, or something like that maybe a one to a That's two right. or a three to a four but something like that with with no gap in between right yep that makes sense and and then in our case where we run mostly temporary infrastructure um you can leave that leave that temporary infrastructure in place you know and and bring the second group in to that area uh behind the first yes. one so yep. yes and i We'll see. The, the experiment goes on, right? I don't. Uh, some year, maybe some year, I'll do the same thing back to back years. But uh, so far, it's just been try something new every year. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, I, I I think we'll be able to get away with fewer. Uh, well, I know we're getting away with fewer wires right now. We used to run them in net fencing, and that was a lot of labor moving them every day um, with net fencing. And so. Now we're running, we're down six wires from that, running them in three wires. And I think we'll probably be able to, be able to get down to two wires of poly wire anyways uh, mm -hmm. for the summer during the growing season. I, I imagine they'll be more, more content <laughs> during that time. Could you set the expectations for somebody who was going to get into sheep and get into sheep specifically as a brush management strategy or or small ruminants i don't want to leave the goat guys out right I, ken you've got i think some experience with goats too 
But could you set the expectations for how long it's going to take to make meaningful change if they were targeting those species and kind of when we when they might be able to expect to reach a stasis of we're in a good place now with a healthy balance of of brush and grass? I've always told um, producers that are looking into <clears throat> to doing some multi-species grazing type stuff is to give yourself some grace. Um, it's not your solution isn't going to be there the first year. Uh, most of the the successful producers that I've talked to have said it's taken about three years um, to get to the point where they feel like some of those species are a little more under control. Um, I would probably argue if you're trying to target a shrub in particular, it's probably going to take a little bit longer, um, but definitely our um, forb species, the leafy spurge is kind of the big one out here that I hear people talk about um, at, at least probably three years. Sure. Ken, what are some of your, some of your experiences uh, with regard to these two things? You mentioned your work in Utah uh, with, um, you know, cattle and sheep together Um and you've had other experiences in other places too, if I remember your history, right? Uh, 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 yeah, a little bit. Um, there's, there's two major approaches to think about. One is, so I'm running, I'm running a ranch and I got a cow herd on it and I want to convert por a portion of that ranch resources from supporting cows to supporting sheep. And, and in the case of that research I was involved in, um, in Utah, the, the idea was that, okay, so if I've got, if, let's say I've got a ranch that supports 200 cows, 200 pairs, and I decide I want to bring sheep in. And, and the approach would be, well, if I was running 200 pairs, I'll, I'll sell a hundred pairs and bring in the equivalent forage use from sheep. And we generally assume that five ewes will consume the same amount of forage as one cow. So I, if I'm running 200 cows, that's my carrying capacity. And I decide to go 50, 50 cows and sheep. I would, I would drop down to a hundred cows. And then in the place of that hundred cows that, that went away, I would bring in 500 ewes and get this 50, 50 balance of forage use. And that's kind of, and that's pretty permanent in terms of that that's that sort of a change um another common thought is that i'm running 200 cows and they're eating mostly grass and very few of the of the forbs or the shrubs they might they nibble on them some, but their their diet's going to be dominated by grass. It's what they're designed to eat. And I've got, but I've I've got a rangeland that has a lot of those broadleaf plants, a lot of forbs, and maybe maybe you know out here in western South Dakota there is some sagebrush, or you got some 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 cedar or juniper or whatever, and you're going, you know, I'm getting absolutely no value out of that at all. So perhaps if I would just add some sheep, I wouldn't have to take cows away. I could just add a few sheep because they eat such a different diet. I really wouldn't be overstocking my ranch that because I'd actually be benefiting it because I'm getting a better balance of what's getting grazed. And and in, and in general, the rule for that is just add one ewe for each cow. So if you're running 200 cows, rather than selling half the cows and coming in with 500 ewes, you'd have 200 cows and as much as 200 ewes just added to the cows. <laughs> um, I don't think I, there had nobody has ever done a research project to study yeah. that in the United States that I know of. And I've, I've looked, I believe they've done some work on that in New Zealand, perhaps where they have a lot of sheep, <laughs> but, um, but I don't know that I can say, yeah, we, we, as, 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 as a, you know, as those of us working for SDSU, who everything we say is research based can point at some research and say, yeah, there's proof that this works other than we know producers that do it and they, and, and they have been able to sustain their operation doing it. So there's gotta be some, some credibility to taking that approach. Mm -hmm. 
And I would, to piggyback off that, say that it largely depends also on, <clears throat> um, like Ken was saying, if if that pasture has a lot of broad leaves or something like that, um, before you buy sheep, I would definitely recommend to take a little bit of a pasture inventory where you're mm -hmm. thinking of putting sheep um, and making sure that there truly is some plant diversity out there. Um, because we know that multi-species grazing increases plant diversity, but not if the plant diversity isn't there to start with. You know, sheep aren't going to go out there and, and magically plant a more diverse rangeland for you. Um, you've got to have some of that there already. Sure. And I guess to throw a bone to the goat guys <laughs> listening or people who, who are interested in goats, is there, is there a set of, uh, species that are present that you would say, no, this is more of a job for goats than, than sheep in your, in your experience? In my experience, the more undesirable species, the more likely it is that you'll get better control of it with goats than, than sheep. They once, and, you know, I mentioned earlier, cows eat grass because that's what they're designed to, to do. They're, they're, they, they're big, they have a huge room and, and they can digest grass better than smaller, smaller animals with smaller rumens. And, and then you, when you take that step from sheep to goats, you, you, you go to an even more extreme of the animal is the goat is not designed to eat grass. They're much more uh, suitable to eating a broadleaf plant. So you got a leafy spurge problem or or any of these other noxious weeds, you're, you're going to get control of it faster and you're gonna get more selective grazing pressure on just the noxious weed with goats than you are with sheep. Sheep will do it for you, but goats will do it faster they'll put more pressure on it. And especially um, like going back to our conversation earlier about <clears throat> some of your brush species, um, goats do a really good job of essentially climbing up in those in trees and brush species and, and managing those a little bit better than sheep will. Um, goats tend to eat a lot more browse type plants since like Ken said, they are more of a, a concentrate selector. Um, so if you're trying to manage, uh, like I was mentioning some research that's going on with SDSU on Western red cedar, um, and they're using goats on that project and they're doing, um, a really nice job of managing some of that Western red cedar, but we talked about fencing and if you're going to run goats, you definitely have to up your fencing game. <laughs> yeah. Is it a swimming pool? Can it hold water? It'll probably hold a goat, but maybe not. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the true in my experience anyways, sheep are easier to keep in than goats. So, yeah. Um any anything else that needs to be said uh regarding this topic? I mean, I know we've kind of scratched the surface here, but or or resources that you would recommend people go and check out as far as uh incorporating or as I said reincorporating uh small ruminants and specifically sheep into their operations. Just to kind of, I guess I'll just kind of do a recap in that if you've got, if if the resources are right, that to 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 add a, an additional species, you got more diversity. Maybe it's desirable diversity, or maybe it's undesirable, and that you've got a noxious weed problem. It, it, adding a species that will help either manage those other spe those undesirable plants, or eat things that that are there that maybe it's not undesirable, but it's still a, a, a plant species that cows are not going to use. It's a way to add additional streams of income that can help. Not only are you helping your land by changing the way it's the grazing is happening on, but you're creating different financial streams that are going to help it, the economic sustainability of, of your ranching operation as well. Um, you know, one of the things that's that, that sheep will do for you is 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 provide more income streams because first they produce two products lambs and wool but second they have a much higher reproductive rate than cattle cattle you know rarely we get do we get twins and uh you, you know cattle are pretty much a single um uh, offspring but sheep you, you get lots of twinning and, and and a little bit of triplets um sometimes triplets are more of a problem than they're worth but twinning is is hugely advantageous in that 
uh, you know, well-managed sheep operations. I, Jay Link can correct me if I'm wrong, but 150% lamb crop is not unheard of. And, and, and other than predators destroying a lot of lambs for you before you can sell that lamb crop, it's a well-managed sheep flock can do probably do better than that. If you can, if, if, if you can keep the predators out. Uh, so you got, you got those, if you can add sheep to a cattle operation, you've now, you've now added two more income streams beyond the calf crop. Jalen, any final thoughts? No, I think Ken pretty much summarized exactly what I was thinking too. A lot of times it's, it's that economic factor. And at the end of the day, um, even if you're improving pastures, we still have to see that monetary, monetary gain. Um, and so like Ken said, um, the, the twinning definitely and the two sources of income from sheep uh, makes their return on investment really attractive. Typically, um, I hesitate to say this on a year like this, you know, when our, our land prices aren't quite as high, but I'm super optimistic that they're going to come up. Um, that you usually in the first year can at least pay for herself between the wool and having two lambs on her. Um, so your return on investment is relatively quick on sheep, which I think is pretty advantageous. Um, and plus, the more you study the markets, um, and this year is a perfect example, the cattle market is looking really good and the sheep market's going down. Um, but even your annual seasonal fluctuations, um, typically we look at when calf prices go down, um, sheep prices tend to go up and those kind of things. So they're, they're very complementary markets for multiple income streams for sure. Right. Yep. One of, one of the, one of the places that these ad, added enterprises of adding a different species can, can really help in a ranching operation is on multi-generation ranches. And the next, the next young generation wants to come home and a cow herd is just not going to support another set of mouths on the same set of resources. You got to, you got to add something and adding more land is not always, so you can increase the cattle operation is not always a viable way to, to support more families on the same ranch. So this is an added enterprise that doesn't necessarily, um, is not as, 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 um, capital intense to get into, to add that, that those additional income streams. Yeah. And your infrastructure is not as capital intense uh, to get set up either. You know, I mean, <laughs> this is no offense to the sheep guys. I'm, I would consider myself one of them. Uh, but almost every one of those sheep places you go to, they really keep a, a pretty healthy supply of baling wire around because you can wire together a couple of panels for a jug or for an alley to run the sheep up and the, it holds them, you know, they, That's they're, right. they're kept in by that. It doesn't have to be pipe corrals and everything <laughs> to, to work on a day when you're running them up the, up the, up the alley to, uh, I'm always tempted to use Australian and New Zealand slang. <laughs> it doesn't have to be a muster and a, and a race and all all those things, but yeah. it doesn't have yeah. to be, you know, it doesn't have to be a real, uh, real solid set setup to run them up the alley to the shearing, uh, to the shearing platform and stuff like that. So I think that there's, there's some, uh, advantages that probably people don't think of in that regard. And I think that, like you said, so, so important that people maybe don't even consider that as an option, as far as bringing the next generation home, like you were saying earlier, if you could run, one one you and I think a really in a really well managed setup you could do at least one you in a really well managed setup I would say you could do more than one you uh, as far as to one cow and and start to see some real uh, economic benefits for for the operation. Would you agree with that in your experience? Yeah, absolutely. I think the one to one ratio is a good starting point, um, and then you can always take a step back and assess your pastures and say, okay. I think I can, I think I can stock more. Um, I guess I would always advise to start low so you're not overgrazing pastures. Um, and then you can make gradual changes from there. Very good. Well, Ken, Jalen, thank you for your time today. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Looking forward to the next episode of the Working Cows podcast. We'll be uh, next week on Monday, Lord willing, intending to release an episode on how to communicate with your stock dog with Dylan Biggs. Uh, we've talked to him about developing that bond in the past and 
uh, on this next episode of the Working Cows podcast, we're going to talk to him about communicating. How do we communicate and when do we discipline, when do we not discipline, and some of those things. So uh, always a good time to have Dylan on the podcast. Looking forward to that coming your way real soon on another episode of the Working Cows podcast. We'll see you then. We invite you to visit workingcows.net to subscribe to the show via iTunes or Stitcher. You'll also find detailed show notes pages, resources from our guests, and the industry leaders who have influenced them. For more ideas on putting your cows to work for you in a more profitable way, tune in next week.